All right, 6.1, moving into a new unit, thinking, language, and intelligence. We're starting off on kind of our thought processes. We're still in this cognitive version of psychology or portion of psychology. So 6.1, what is thinking? Concepts, creativity, problem solving, um, and how, how does that help us understand human cognition? So starting off with creativity, um, oftentimes creativity gets broken down into um, kind of two different forms here, at least in psychology. We've got convergent and divergent thinking. Um, and these are kind of how they sound, right? Convergent thinking is kind of honing in on a single answer, um, but divergent thinking is often thought of as this more kind of creative form of thinking. Um, it's it gives us this like many, many versions of something, many possible solutions, right? Divergent thinking is starting at a point and then broadening what that means, going from there and seeing how much you can learn, how much you can figure out. Whereas convergent is taking a lot of information and then narrowing it down to help make a decision. Okay, so divergent and convergent. Oftentimes creative thinking um, is, is, is kind of this process of starting at an idea of what you want to get to, diverging from there and coming up with as many possible solutions as you can. And then from all of those, converging on the best possible solution. Okay. So psychology's definition of, cre of creativity here is kind of the ability to produce new and valuable ideas. Okay? And you have to have that divergent thinking to be able to do that. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about later in the year, a guy named Daniel Pink. And one of the things that he, as a psychologist, is a big believer in is this like new world of employment that we're living in, in which creativity is the single most valuable skill. The ability to think divergently is quickly becoming the most important thing we have in a world where computers can do so much, right? Computers and um, robots are going to be able, automation is going to take more and more jobs away from us, um, right? In a world where we can buy anything on Amazon without leaving the house. People, we don't need people as much anymore to do these rote tasks, right? Doing the same thing, convergent thinking over and over again. More and more and more, we have machines that can do this. Divergent thinking, right? Broad, creative strokes. We're nowhere close to a point where a computer can do this. Um, and by the time we get there, it's, I mean, that's that's the like science fiction -y dangerous stuff where we want a computer to think creatively better than a human can. Um, that's when they start out thinking us. So convergently, it's a series of algorithms. We know that a teacher, a, a, um, a computer can do this, right? It's this question that we have to get humans to do to think creatively. So when we're trying to problem solve and figure things out, um, we do this in a number of ways, right? Algorithms and heuristics uh, are the most well-known and big, the most main ones you need to know for this. Insight learning is one we talked about last unit, but it's also one of our problem solving strategies of just kind of that eureka moment. So we talk about this a little bit in class, but algorithms and heuristics, recall, um, algorithms are a step-by-step -step slow process. If we're trying to figure out a word search to figure out these answers we could go through be like all right buffalo start with go down every letter and look for the letter b okay so scroll through if we see a letter b we are going to pick that letter and then see if we can find the word buffalo from there all right here's a b there's no use around it so we carry on or we could more heuristically solve that problem and just try to scan this as fast as we can and see if it jumps out. This is an easy one. It does kind of jump out. It's on that front row. Um, so heuristics are good in one ways in that they're a shortcut. They make things faster, but they're much more error prone. Um, they're not going to find all of the answers. Heuristics to solve this, um, we could probably find five or six words, right? Real quick, buffalo, chicken, horse. Um, right, like we're going to find a couple of these in there pretty quickly, but it's not going to find all of them. Algorithms, however, would find every single one of these if we go through slowly and do this. This is a step by step procedure that guarantees an outcome, right? It's more automatic. Um, it's less automatic. It's much more step by step, intentional process. This is slow thinking. It's manual thinking. It's putting our brain into hard work thinking, not automatic jumping to conclusions thinking. Heuristics are a good thing. We want these. We want to be able to think quickly because we want our brain to move quickly. Um, if we just have algorithms, we would never get anything done. Insight learning, of course, that eureka moment. Sometimes that happens looking at an inside bread puzzle, um, right? Like maybe one just immediately jumps out at you. Uh, that's an insight. It wasn't either of these. Okay. So um, 
some examples of heuristics and how they're problematic, right? One of those is the representative heuristic, which oftentimes is associated with stereotypes. We judge the likelihood of things and depending on how particular our mental image of that is, right? In class, we talked about the short, slim poetry lover. Right, and what that looked like. Um, if you haven't had class yet, I'll save that one for you. Um, but this contributes to stereotypes, right? Like the classic representative heuristic from the office of Michael Scott just being ridiculous. Right? Picture a convict. What's he wearing? Nothing special. Baseball cap, baggy pants. He says something ordinary like, yo, that shizzle. Now open your eyes again. What are you picturing? Black man wrong. That was a white woman. Surprised? Shame on you. Right. A ridiculous example, of course, um, as most of what Michael Scott does. Um, but these representative heuristics, again, are meant in order for us to think quickly and not um, waste time. But they cause all kinds of problems. Right. When you take this out of kind of the humorous context, um, we hold all of these stereotypes and um, these representative heuristics are a big reason for that. Our brain jumps to conclusions in order to save us time. But that leads to us assuming things about people or about entire groups of people based on our understanding of them. Similarly, the availability heuristic can cause problems. Uh, we estimate, overestimate, or underestimate things based on our remembrance of stuff. Um, if something is very memorable, we're going to assume that it's more common, right? Um, right. So if it's so if it's something like a plane crash, we assume plane crash. Most people are going to think they're are people going to be way more afraid of plane crashes than they should be because when a plane crash happens, it's all over the news. It's everywhere. Anytime a major airline plane crashes, it's it's in the news for weeks. And this question of what happened, what went wrong, they make movies about it. Um, and so we think it's way more likely because it's easy to remember. But car crashes happen every day, and we don't think about them. Right, because they don't make the news because they're not right there. So availability heuristic are um, how easy it is to remember something. If something has been in the news recently, we're much more likely to overestimate how likely that is to happen. Um, a biggie, and I talked about this with Annie, was uh, the the tendency for helicopters to crash and how dangerous helicopters are. Um, they're not right. Helicopters are not more dangerous than I mean, they're more dangerous than an, a commercial airliner, but they're less dangerous than a, a private plane. Right? And they're way less dangerous than a car. Um, but we overestimated that their uh, dangerousness in the wake of the uh, Kobe Bryant crash. Right? Any big name crash and it's all over the news. It, we overestimate how important that is. Um, other problem solving obstacles, things that get in the way for us, confirmation bias, belief, perseverance. These I often think of as like the political problems here. These are at the kind of root of a lot of our political division right now. In an age of the Internet, it's really, really frustrating trying to talk to people that don't agree with the same things you do. Uh, much of that because we are prone, we are primed as a species to consistent to want like homeostasis, to want our brains um, to uh, not be challenged in some way. And we have begun to teach politics almost as a form of obsession or as much as we would teach like a religion. It's become something that is very much a part of people. And so uh, when someone challenges those beliefs, we have a tendency to reject that. Or when someone says something we agree with, um, we, we tend to accept that in some way. Right. So um, I love the, uh, the the classic Drake meme to remember these. But belief perseverance is when someone tells you something that you don't like or don't agree with, you tend to reject that. You say that can't be true. Like, no, 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 I have I have evidence of that. That can't be true. Right. Look at watch politicians when they're up there and a journalist poses a question. So like, here's a tweet that you said X amount of time ago. Can you speak to that? And they're like, oh, OK. So the jour journalists are out to get us. That never happened. Like, I, I have evidence of it. That never happened. Next question. Right? They just reject it outright. Um, and so uh, while that is a little bit like that, might maybe a perfect example, because that's more just like lying. Belief perseverance is the tendency to just like not actually believe things um, that 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 we have when we have evidence of the contrary, right? Think about like, if we're to think about the example of a stolen election, right? Belief perseverance uh, would be on either edge of that um, saying, or I guess if you were saying that like, no, the election was absolutely stolen, um, right? It was like, well, we have evidence that it wasn't, 
right? We have absolutely no evidence of anything. Um, and they were like, well, I refuse to believe that. I, I think there is evidence. We're like, well, there, we don't have any. We're like, well, I think there is. Um, and it's just rejecting any evidence that you do here because you have so firmly of a belief. Confirmation bias um, is holding on to your belief, intending to look for things that back up your worldview. Think about your media bubble, the, the Twitter or Facebook or TikTok, or whatever that you're following. Um, when you see things that back up your worldview, you that make you feel good. And so you want to watch those things more, right? Um, right? Look at like this, the kind of conspiracy theory QAnon. There's no evidence of anything that they say. It is a wild conspiracy theory. And it's led people to rush into pizza shops with assault rifles and to rush a Capitol building. Um, but it um, has there's, there's no evidence of it. And yet any slightest version of something that backs up their worldview um, gets blown up into a massive piece of evidence because of confirmation bias, because people are looking for something um, to back up their worldview. And they will be much more likely to believe that. <laughs> Right. In the same vein, like anyone that makes claims about if you made any form of diabolical claim about Trump, um, more left leaning people are going to always say, yeah, I believe that for sure. Right. Because you know, they, they feel passionately um, that he is despicable in some way. And so they are pretty likely to believe that even if they don't have evidence of it. So confirmation bias is going to back up our worldview, um, whatever that might be, and say, yeah, you're right. And it feels good. Belief perseverance is when we do get evidence we don't like, we reject it. Um, and then intuition, this is that gut feeling one, right? The gut feeling one. I, this is one where I like, I saw I had friends um, that I knew in high school, that, like sent me some articles about the election talking about now, well, it's like, here's some evidence that the election was stolen. And I looked through the evidence and it wasn't evidence. It was a random uh, statistician throwing up some piece of random thing that said, clearly based on this, the election is stolen. And that was like a lot of that's confirmation bias for those people. Um, but they also look at it and they're like, within this, it feels like there's no way that, um, that Biden could have possibly won. Or like the claim that um, Biden did worse than Obama in all of the states Obama won, except for the swing states that Biden won that Obama didn't. And I've heard many people say, well, that's evidence that it had to be a sham, that it was fake in some way, um, right? Because it feels wrong, but there's no evidence that there was cheating. So it can't be until there is evidence, right? Like, so um, intuition is another one that like pushes us to believe something. This is that kind of like overconfidence. We trust our gut feeling without evidence, right? We have to have the evidence to believe that, especially in psychology where this is a science. Um, and then other things, um, overconfidence, again, overestimating our own beliefs and judgment, assuming that we know best uh, a mental set. This is kind of like representative heuristics, um, but it's more about like a, a technique that we use. We approach problems with a mindset of what worked in the past, right? You're like, well, last time I did this problem, this is how this worked. Um, this is very helpful, but it can also get in the way because it blocks us from coming up with new divergent or creative forms of thinking, right? The more we solve a problem a certain way, the less likely we are to change that up because we're like, well, it worked in the past. We're going to keep doing it. Um, that mental set is always looking at something and assuming that's how um, the best way to solve it is. And then framing is the way that we word something, the way that we set something up um, can really change the way we make decisions. Right? Um, buy one, get one free. May not actually be that much money saved if it's like, know, compared to having things 50% off or something like that. But buy one, get one feels so good. Getting something free feels amazing. Um, and that is going to sell more things than if you just said 50% off, right? Because you get something free, even though it's the same. Um, uh, similar here, frozen yogurt. If we had put on there 80% fat free or contains 20% fat, which one is people really more likely to buy? They're going to buy the one that's framed where 80% fat free. It sounds better. It makes them think it's better. Um, we can also get all kinds of different like priming of different ways, framed in a certain way uh, to make us jump to a certain conclusion. So that is what we've got for 6.1. We'll talk about language next. Um, and then later on in the unit, get into intelligence and how we quantify that. So that's it for the day. Much love.